Amen, amen. Stand, uh, remain standing with me. We're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 55. A very familiar verse of scripture for some of you because I've preached on it. It's one of my favorites that I've used from time to time in different messages for different purposes. But I want it to be kind of the foundational verse we, we launch from this evening. Uh, Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 10. Isaiah 55 and verse 10. The Bible says, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven. Somebody say, rain and snow. And it returns not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh the earth to bring forth, and to bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be. Somebody say, so shall my word be. As the rain and the snow comes down, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. All right, you can put your Bibles down. Uh, let's pray one more time before we're seated and just ask the Lord to illuminate, to give some revelation to us tonight through his word and to, uh, to place within and plant within us a hunger to know his word and an understanding that what we believe absolutely matters. Can you pray to that end? Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. Pray, Lord, tonight that it would do what its purpose is in this house, illuminate, give revelation, Lord. And I pray, God, that we would leave here as a, as a people with a fresh desire to know your word and a fresh commitment to understand your word and to study your word and a renewed understanding of the importance and the value of right doctrine, the word of God. In the name of Jesus, somebody shout in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you hug somebody's neck before you're seated or greet them in the name of Jesus. Let them know how much you appreciate them. Amen. I am taking from a series previously taught several years ago, one particular lesson, and I'm going to teach to us tonight why it matters what you believe. Why it matters what you believe. Now, we know from last week, if you were here, that each week of the month, I'm specifically, or whoever I asked to speak, is specifically targeting particular areas of subject. Uh, and so there's a theme every month, the same repeating theme, and that is that on the first week of the month, for instance, as we did last week, we're going to teach on, uh, on, on, on biblical uh, activity, but more specifically, if I can remember the word, uh, habits of the scripture. We talked about the disciples' disposition, and so we are going to focus on that first uh, Wednesday night of every single month in our teaching to talk about uh, disciplines and habits that every disciple ought to develop. So spiritual disciplines, prayer and, and study of the word and the fasting. We're going to talk about why we do things and we're going to talk about how we do things. That's the first Wednesday of the month. The second Wednesday of the month, the Wednesday that we're in now, we're going to talk about doctrine. Every second Wednesday, Obviously, the Lord speaks or tells us to go a different direction. We will, but our plan is that on the second Wednesday, our Bible teaching and instruction will be focused on issues of doctrine. And so, with that in mind, this first Wednesday, I want to talk to us from the perspective of why doctrine matters, why it matters so that from this point forward, when we are hearing about doctrine and what the Scripture says about what we ought to believe, we have the foundation that it absolutely is important to grasp a hold of. Why it matters what you believe. The fact of the matter is, is that bad information is toxic to the soul. We know that wrong information can eventually poison an entire system. Whatever you might be a part of, if poison gets involved, whatever the information that comes in, if it's poison... It will disrupt and eventually destroy the entire system. For instance, the principle of toxicity 
is behind how pesticides work. How many of you are sick and tired during the summer, of, especially if you're the one caring for the lawn, you go out, you, you pull weeds, and, and within a week and a half or so, you start to see them crack, uh, pop back through the cracks in the pavement, and it doesn't hardly matter what you do. You, you just can't seem to control it. It gets old. Well, they came up and invented, and it's not perfect, but, but they developed pesticides, how they could stop certain weeds and certain things from growing. And so the principle of toxicity is behind how pesticides work. An herbicide kills the plant because it is a hormone that gives that plant bad information. Somebody say bad information. Toxic information. It tells the plant to grow faster than its capacity to absorb the necessary nutrients to sustain life will allow. And so it literally grows itself to death. Why? Because its information base is wrong. Toxicity. Now, to the casual observer at first, nothing looks really out of place or amiss until death of that plant or whatever it is will inevitably occur because it looks like it's growing and it can even look like it's healthy, but eventually it outgrows its ability to sustain. And this is the case when it comes to understanding that toxic information can do the same thing to people. Doctrine, especially toxic doctrine. I've seen people that say, Pastor, I've got a new revelation. I, I, I'm looking for other things. I don't believe this way anymore. Guess what? Sometimes at first it looks like they're doing better. But eventually, give it long enough, that toxic information will destroy their walk with God. It will destroy their study. It will destroy any new growth. Why? Because the bad information poisoned the entire system, starting with bad information. One of the toxic ideas that I'll mention, for instance, that could be devastating to us as Christians, it's popular in the Christian circles of the world today, it runs something like this. It doesn't matter what you believe, it only matters in whom you believe. First of all, you can't believe in Jesus without believing in his doctrine. So it matters what you believe on so many levels. But I think even just anyone with half a brain can know right off the bat that that's just silly. That's just some new way of trying to say, I can live how I want, think what I want, and, and Jesus is love, and so I'm going to be okay. And that's just not supported in the scripture. The proponents and supporters would have us believe that the greatest accomplishment of Christianity in the last 30 years has been really the demolition of doctrinal distinctives all in favor of, of a false, but what they call unity, a false unity. Unity is important. It's part of doctrine. But there's nothing more important at the cost of losing right doctrine. False doctrine is a spiritual herbicide. It's toxic information. And the problem is that individuals that ingest that information, are, they, they think they are and they look like they're still growing spiritually. I remember Brother Stone King years ago saying something to the effect that oftentimes when people are in strong delusion where the scripture talks about that those that have not a love for the truth, the doctrine, they, uh, they will believe a lie and be damned. But not only is it a, a lie I believe, but it's, it's God. The Bible says that I, God, will send a strong delusion. They'll believe a lie and be damned. And his point was, Brother Stone King said, it's, it's sad, but often false doctrine and, and revelation, it, it feels like revelation, he said, because it comes from the same source. God sending a delusion because they didn't love truth. And so it feels the same way as revelation feels. You better be very careful what you believe and what you allow yourself to accept. Because those that in, in, ingest false doctrine, they look like they're still growing spiritually, but they, they never realize they've been fed toxic information and they're dying spiritually before they know it. And eventually they believe anything, live any way, and they are lost by all standard of Scripture. And they don't even know it. The adverse, though, is true. True doctrine. Somebody shout true doctrine. True doctrine is a liberator. It liberates every soul that believes it. True doctrine. Somebody shout true doctrine. 
is a supernatural fertilizer, the opposite, that brings real growth and brings real transformation. How? Through the power of God. How? Through his word. The word doctrine is so important to us or else it would not occur 50 times in our King James Version Bible. And it always means, when it appears in the, in the scripture, it always means the substance of something taught. I believe in catching things, spiritually speaking. I'm not in favor of catching COVID and things like that so much. But I believe in catching things spiritually. You got to be somewhere, you got to be present. There's inspiration and revelation. But I also know that some things you only get by studying the substance or hearing it by the taught word of God. How many of you appreciate the miracles of Jesus in the scripture? How many of you think that those miracles in the gospels are amazing when you look at them and read them? And how many of you would even say, I'm hungry to see the miraculous in our church? Amen. I am too. I, I love the stories and I love to talk about the miracles. And we even think sometimes, uh, why aren't we seeing as many miracles as when Jesus was on earth? Can I tell you something? The gospel writers repeatedly record that while the miracles were wonderful, the crowds were astonished at Jesus' doctrine, his teaching. And not because its style was exceptional, uh, exceptional but because its substance was supernatural. He taught with an anointed authority. And so Bible doctrine is more than just a, a musty subject for, you know, stuffy theologians. It is the very substance, something taught, it's the very substance of our faith. That's why it matters. Doctrine must always be distinguished from dogma. Somebody say dogma. The difference is this. Dogma is man's statement of truth. As set forth, say, in a creed or a declaration. Dogma is man's statement of truth, but doctrine is God's revelation of truth. And it is set forth in the scriptures that we have the privilege to have hold of. And so that is why Bible doctrine has supernatural power when that Bible doctrine is believed and it can turn the world upside It has turned the world upside down. It's turned your world upside down. It's turned my world upside down. And it continues to do so, especially in the hearts and the minds of people throughout the world. Why? It's supernatural when it's believed. So when you believe, uh, rather what you believe is important because, number one, false doctrine is spiritual herbicide. And it matters or is important what you believe, number two, because true doctrine has supernatural power when it's believed. Believing in the right thing was so important, and, and it is so important, that the wise man wrote in Proverbs 23 and 23, by the truth, and sell it not. Once you get it, don't you exchange it for any measure of any product of any value. Buy the truth and sell it not. And then he says also wisdom and instruction and understanding. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul prophesied that there would be a time that would come where they will not endure sound doctrine. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. And I don't know about you, but I can't. I, I know there's been other times just as dark, but I'm telling you, we are... It, there's no generation that fulfills that scripture quite like this generation does. There will be those that will not endure sound doctrine. We're living in a church age that has lost its mooring from the word of God. Many churches have rejected doctrinal preaching as harsh, unloving, and even obsolete. They, they literally never address the, the, the things you, they believe. It's a self-help. It's a, it's a glorification of self. And it becomes a distraction and eventually a destruction. And so in doing, they have unwittingly joined the ranks of those that have, Paul said, a form of godliness in 2 Timothy 3. A form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Why? Because it's the word of God, it's doctrine that brings supernatural power. Somebody say, it matters what I believe. Doctrine. Doctrine, this word doctrine 
In the dictionary, it means teachings or instruction. It means the principles of religion that are taught. The literal meaning of doctrine is to teach the substance. The substance of what? The substance of the ways, the person, the desires of Jesus Christ, our God. To teach the substance. So tonight, I want to give you, first of all, three definitions of doctrine that we come that come from the scripture. Number one, if you'd like to write these down, please do so. Number one, doctrine is like yeast. How many of you have ever appreciated the benefits of yeast? How many of you have ever uh, eaten my wife's uh, cinnamon rolls? Let me tell you, whether you know it or not, you truly have appreciated the blessing of yeast. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. But here's what, what is interesting. Yeast works silently and secretly in, 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 a, in a way. Eventually, that yeast influences the whole lump of the dough that it's in. And doctrine, whether false or true, will eventually influence all of you. Doctrine is like yeast. Jesus said this. Well, Pastor, where do you get that from? Matthew 16 and 6. The Bible says, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven, the yeast, of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And in verse 12, it says, Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Jesus gives a parallel here with that particular understanding. Beware of their teaching. Beware of their doctrine. Why? Because like leaven, it will affect everything it touches. I implore you as Christians, as apostolics, you better know what doctrine you allow to infiltrate your thinking. Because the wrong doctrine will eventually overtake the all of you. Now, if you get a hold of a dead doctrine or a man-made doctrine, what you need to understand is it will eventually kill your experience. Pastor, what, what do you mean experience? If you've gotten a hold of a living experience, and I'm going to tell you this, Jesus' name, water baptism, infilling of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues is a living experience. But if you get a hold of a living experience, then you better attach yourself to a living, live doctrine. Why? Because if you don't, Eventually, dead doctrine will kill that experience. Live doctrine is rooted where? In the words of the scripture and nothing else. Not made by man. So doctrine is like yeast, number one. Number two, it's like yeast in that it affects every part. Number two, doctrine is like wind. The Bible alludes that false doctrine can uproot believers like strong winds can uproot trees, like in Psalm chapter 1 and 4. True doctrines can affect an entire society. False doctrines can uproot an entire society when they're demonstrated by believers. There's a gentleman by the name of George Barna, and he put together a research group that has influenced Christianity in a tremendous way. They've done research and got numbers, if you will, on, on things that we always guessed at and wondered about, about the viewpoint of America and our society toward Bible, church attendance, all these things. And what George Barna discovered in his research is this, that unless a group is 20% different than its surrounding society, it cannot impact that society. That's why I, I, I don't have any problem people saying, well, apostolics are a little different than the rest of the church world. If we're not at least 20% different, we're not going to be effective in reaching the world around us. That's why we are in the world, but we're not of the world. That's why we embrace not only the way we believe, but also the way we live. There is a difference. Why? Because if it's done right and in the spirit of love and kindness and humility, it will stand as a testament to the truth that's in you and the doctrine you believe. It matters. Why? 
because we got to be 20% different. I don't know about you, but I want to reach the world around me. I want people to notice something is different about me. I want to lead people to Jesus. I want to affect people that are lost and broken and hurting and their lives are in ruin. I want to see those kind of people. I want to see them born again and living life and the experience I talked to. I want to see that. But we've got to be different. We can't be self-righteous in our, in our difference. And we can't be indifferent in our difference. Uncaring and aloof superior, but we've got to be different because we cannot have an impact if we're not. People are looking for something, folks, and I'm telling you right now, they're not going to find it in the world. They've already discovered that. The things of the world are, are so already so disappointing to the point that now the world and, and the things of the world are, are tending ever more to ungodliness and Satanism and self. That is the doctrine of Satanism, the, the doctrine of self and self-gratification. It's from the pit of hell. Self and the idolatry of self is the ploy of the enemy. And now it's not even a secret. I mean, if you're paying attention to the Grammys, I guess I don't watch the Grammys, and there's a good reason why, and I think all of us now see even better reason why. The other evening, I guess, they had basically just Satanism and Satanic uh, rituals on full display, and uh, I read one tweet that talked, I think it was from CBS, that talked about we're ready to get our worship on uh, in, in reference to Sam Smith, the individual that was all dressed up as a, as, as, as a demon and, and uh, the fire and the darkness and everything that that if you haven't seen it, I would almost tell you don't go see it. Just understand, I'm telling you, the world ain't even trying to hide the world anymore. <laughs> it matters what we believe. And we got to be different. They're trying to be different. There are agendas in the world. I just went through a drive through today, and I told my wife, I said, everything they do, there's an agenda. It's it's everywhere. They they. They wear rainbow, and I think you know where I'm going with this. They do everything. Everything they do is with the agenda pushing behind it. That's not incidental. And I would say it's not even that person. They don't understand, but there is a spirit in the world today pushing the advancement of ungodliness and immorality, and they, it's in everything they do. Why? Because if they're not 20% different, they're not going to affect. It's time the church be radical again about being a little different. It's time the church be renewed again about possessing the fact that I love people, but I do not love this world or the spirit of this world in the sense that I want to be anything like it. I don't want to blend in. I want to be different. And again, I'm not going to requalify it, but I, I will tell you, if you're ugly and you're, you're, you're self-righteous, you're just as lost as anybody else. You're just as mistaken as anybody else. And, and let me say this, your difference don't have to be weirdness either. I'm just going to leave that right there. Just Let me get back to the notes. <laughs> There's some weird people out there in, in the church world. Whew, praise God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. The Bible says that we henceforth be no more children. Watch what Paul says here. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed, doctrine is like the wind. Remember, that's what we're on. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. What's Paul talking about? That we not be tossed to and fro by what? By the winds of doctrine. He says we, we can't be tossed to and fro anymore. That's verse 14. Why does he say this in this location? Well, let's back up. And read the beginning of Ephesians chapter two, 4 and verse 2. So verse 14 says, henceforth. Somebody say henceforth. That means that what preceded that verse is the reason why we say we cannot now be tossed to and fro. Because of what I just addressed, now we know what we need to believe so that we're not tossed to and fro by every other wind of doctrine. 
What did he just get done saying just a few verses earlier? Same chapter, Ephesians 4 and 2. He says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Listen, everything we believe has to be on the foundation of love. Love for God, love for one another. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Then he goes into it. What's the doctrine? There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called the one hope of your calling. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Henceforth, we don't have to wonder what we believe. I just shared it with you. Now we ought not be tossed to and fro. Why? Because we know what we believe. We know it's true. That's the doctrine we need to hold on to. You know why we're apostolic? Because this is exactly what we teach and believe, the apostles' doctrine. I don't want some distant couple thousand years removed version of that story and that doctrine. I want that doctrine. That's why we baptize in Jesus' name, not in the titles. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Jesus directed his disciples on the side of a mountain. Nobody's being baptized in the moment to baptize in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost. Paul clarifies in Colossians chapter 2 that in him, Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In Jesus, what is the name of the Father? What is The only all-encompassing name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all those titles, is the name Jesus Christ. That's why there was no confusion when Peter stood up, commissioned to preach the first message after Jesus ascends to heaven, and the brethren say, or those that are convicted say, brethren, what must we do? In Acts 2 and 37, Peter says in verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift. There was no confusion when Paul told them in Acts 19, you need to be rebaptized after John's baptism. How? In the name of the Lord Jesus. I want what the apostles were teaching. There's not a scholar in the world that's of any value or has any real depth or knowledge. There's not a reputable scholar that would not tell you the way they practiced baptism in, G- in, the, in the days of Scripture was they submersed and they spoke the name of Jesus. The title method or or formula of baptism did not come into existence until some 200 plus years after the close of the canonized scriptures and the death of the apostles. I want what the apostles taught. It matters. It matters what we believe. We've got to get it right because salvation is at stake. If we water it down in any way, then we are in danger of losing it all. I want what they taught. That's why I don't believe that tongues have ceased. There's nowhere in your scripture that tells us when that would come. The only reference they have is Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 13, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. But he also says, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Anybody realize knowledge is still out there? It hasn't vanished yet. Tongues haven't ceased yet. And so when in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 8 and in Acts chapter 10, it says that they received the Holy Ghost. How? For they heard them speak with tongues. It matters what we believe. And I want what the apostles taught. I want what Jesus gave to them and what they gave to us. I don't want some 2,000 years removed doctrine. Is this all right? It matters what you believe. Get in the scriptures. I would even, I think at the, at, the, at the understanding of what I'm saying, I would even say don't take my word for it. If anybody tries to tell you not to go further in the word of God and just take my word for it, you better run. I'm not trying to be ugly tonight. I know people believe certain things, and there's been some clouds around what is true doctrine. So I challenge you, you get in that book and read it for yourself. And even study those that have embraced some of these things I've touched on. And they will acknowledge, reputable scholars will acknowledge, that's the way they did it. Baptism, that's the way they did it. They spoke in tongues. That's the way it happened in that day. And I say it has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The grass might wither. 
and the flower might fade. But the word of God is forever settled in the heavens. Praise God. It matters what we believe. I've gotten off the notes so many times tonight. We're going to struggle to get through this, but we're going to get through it in Jesus' name. Paul says this is the doctrine, what? The apostles' doctrine. That's why we teach and believe what we teach and believe. Study it for yourself. Make sure you know what the Word of God says, not what some Christian or some, some church or, 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 or denomination, for that matter. It matters that they're in the book. Somebody say amen or oh me. All right, doctrine is like yeast. Doctrine is like the wind. Number three, doctrine is like rain. Rain is symbolic of revival. Rain is refreshing. It gives restoration after a time of drought, a time of famine. And Bible doctrine is heaven-sent teaching. You cannot have a real move of God without true doctrine. Hello, somebody. That is why some preachers can get up and preach on doctrine and the place absolutely blows up and miracles start falling and the Holy Ghost is poured out. He never preached about miracles, never preached about the Holy Ghost necessarily. He just preached on sometimes the oneness of God and who Jesus is. And all of a sudden, power breaks loose. Why? Because it's like the rain doctrine. Real moves of God come. Why? Because of right teaching and preaching. Don't believe my words. Believe the words of Scripture. Deuteronomy 32 and 2 says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Habakkuk 2 and 14 says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. How? As the waters cover the sea. The knowledge of the word of the Lord. That's doctrine. True doctrine is like the rain. It brings revival. It brings growth. It brings harvest. It brings refreshing. It's like yeast. It affects everything it touches. Doctrine, good or bad, it will affect the all of you. It'll, a dead doctrine will kill a live experience if, if left long enough. It's like yeast. Doctrine, it's like the wind. And it's like the rain. Three distinct definitions of doctrine. Now let me share with you three differences doctrine makes. And I promise I won't take as long on, those, on these three. Write these down if you care to. Number one, doctrine will make a difference in our character. What we are is affected by right doctrine. The power of the gospel to transform a life is not activated until a person obeys the doctrine. Jude said, once delivered to the saints. Romans 6, Paul says in verse 17, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of... Romans 6 and 17, they're going to have to... They, they won't believe. I just told them earlier, don't take my word for it. Just God be thanked. You have obeyed from the heart that form of... Somebody shout, Doctrine. That was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Somebody say, it matters what I believe. Number one, doctrine makes a difference in our character, what we are. Number two, doc I told you I'm going to take as long. Doctrine makes a difference on our behavior. What we do matters. The bottom line is a heart that is obedient to the Bible and to its doctrine will always adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. That's Titus chapter 2 and verse 10. Adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And I believe this applies especially, in many ways, but especially through an obvious lifestyle of godliness and holiness. Beginning with the condition of the heart, not a list of rules and procedures. I believe in standards, and we'll talk about them this year at least the necessity of standards. I often teach standards in one-on-one -on -one personal devotion when someone says, I'm interested, I want to grow, tell me about what we believe. I, I'll do that. But I will teach on the reason and the need for standards 
And we'll do that this year. In fact, maybe we'll just make that the next lesson, why standards are important. But I'm not even talking about standards right now. I'm talking about a desire to please God. That's what holiness is. I want to serve God, and I want to do everything I can to please him. 1 Timothy 6 and 3 says, If any man teach otherwise, and can sit not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine. Somebody say, it's Paul saying, not, saying it, not pastor. It's the Apostle Paul. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, that person is proud. Paul did not play games, y'all. He's proud. He's un- he knows nothing. That's what the Bible says. Knows nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words. That's why I don't waste time arguing with fools, folks. Bishop, you better come teach the rest of I'm going to get in trouble tonight. We had someone recently trying to split hairs on stuff that don't matter a hill of beans. Ain't in the book. Doting about questions and strifes of words. Run from those people. I think Bishop, actually, I better not let him up here. He called it a cancer last week or two weeks ago. He's not wrong. Whereof cometh envy and strife. What happens as a result of these individuals? They cause envy. They cause strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. That's why I don't get on social media and go off. tell you something about holiness for a minute. It matters how you act on social media. And I'm not trying to be ugly, but that's not the place to argue. It's not the place to vent. It's not the place to go off. You've got to be careful. Why? Because we are a people of godliness and holiness, and our example matters. See, you thought I was going to talk about holiness and talk about the way we dress and all that. That matters, and I'll get into it sometime, especially those that are hungry to know it and why we believe what we believe. But listen to me. I'm talking about some stuff that absolutely got, it's got to govern the way we live. It's got to govern the way we talk and communicate with one another. Don't get on social media and go off and argue about politics and stuff like that. Why? Why? This makes us all look foolish. The reason why is because what I'm getting to, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. He, he says, he says we got to follow doctrine that's according to godliness, and those that don't are proud and knowing nothing, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, from such withdraw thyself. Don't get on social media and do ignorant things. Why? Because I'm withdrawing myself from that. And I would encourage you to do the same thing. Praise God. I haven't seen anything. I ain't been on social media looking at people's posts, so just know I'm talking true doctrine. (laughs) Paul says those that don't consent to true doctrine, it affects their behavior. They're proud. They're envious. They're evil planners, et cetera, et cetera. And then Paul says, don't be around them. Get away from people like that. You need to ask yourself, am I a person that people are saying I need to get away from? Three differences doctrine makes. Character, behavior. Number three, destiny, where we go. Our eternal destiny hangs on the doctrine that we choose to believe. And and, and far from being a non-issue, if you will, our obedience to Bible doctrine is, is the central issue in receiving salvation. 1 Timothy 4, Paul says, take heed, verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine and continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You want to know why? I will speak the truth in love, but I will speak the truth until the day I die. Because I know that what I say causes those that hear me their salvation and their eternity to weigh in the balance. Now, everybody's saying, well, yes, that's, that's the pastor's role, etc. But I'm going to stop right there and say, and so is yours. The way you live, the way you talk, the way you exemplify Jesus. 
and the doctrine you believe and share. It matters. All right, let me finish tonight. Three definitions, three differences doctrine makes, and I'll close it with three demands that doctrine will make. Number one, doctrine demands purity. Listen, this is good teaching. I don't care who you are. The the only true test for the purity of teaching is the purity of life it produces. I'm going to say that again. The only true test for the purity of teaching is the purity of life it produces. I, I share with someone even tonight that we don't serve God out of how much can I do and still be saved. We serve God out of how much can I do to please my Savior. Bible says, Job 11, 4, for thou hast said my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. And I feel the Holy Ghost right there. My doctrine is pure. Because of what I embrace and what I live and what I believe, I'm clean in the eyes of the Lord. Jesus in Matthew 7 and 20 says, wherefore by their fruit shall you know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Doctrine demands purity. Number two, three demands. Doctrine demands love. The converts at Pentecost continued first in doctrine, it says, and then secondly in fellowship. Acts 2 and 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. That word fellowship is is a word that that describes a devotion to one another. Koinonia, devotion, commitment to one another, and in breaking bread and in prayers. By the way, I'm just setting up the stage here. I'm not saying we're going to be so busy around the church that you don't ever have time for family, because if you know me very well, I love my family, and I'm very, very, very intentional about making sure they're the priority in my life. But I'll also tell you that the idea that a less busy church is a healthy church is foolish. I know some of you are like, oh, boy, I'm I'm not being ugly. Somebody say, pastor's not being ugly. Read Acts chapter 2 after the salvation message that Peter shares, and you tell me how the language that they continue daily in the temple and in house to house, you tell me how we can get around thinking that we ought to have nothing but a couple nights a week where the church is involved with the church. And with our community. We are apostolic in the way we live and what we believe. We got to be apostolic in our commitment to one another. And to the community that is the church that will affect the world. Man, I am feeling it tonight. We got to be about the Father's business, folks. They continued, said that the measure of common light between believers will determine the measure of their fellowship. That's why it matters what we believe. It's going to give us the unity. Some, and I'm, I'm nearly done, some wrongly sacrifice fellowship for doctrine. I'll say that again. Some wrongly sacrifice fellowship for doctrine, while others wrongly sacrifice doctrine for fellowship. But my point is this, though all of our doctrine might be exactly right, if, somebody say if, the biggest little word in the Bible, if we do not love, we are nothing in God's sight. 1 Corinthians 13 and 2, Paul says, and though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity or love, I'm nothing. The highest degree of love is going to treat people right. But I'll also tell you the highest degree of love will never negate the need for obedience to doctrine. Finally, doctrine demands. It demands purity, it demands love, and it demands obedience. Somebody shout obedience. Demands obedience. We never really understand truth until we obey truth. 
I, I'm convinced some people are never going to understand the power and submission until they submit. I, I wish we could teach it enough. We, we can teach on submission, even, even uh, hair being the glory and, and how it aligns to headship and submission. All that's, all that's wonderful, but it's never really going to be fully understood until it's obeyed. Sometimes we are mistaken in thinking we've got to know everything about the word before we obey the word. If it's in here, we ought to obey it. Why? Because we, can, we should have teaching and explain. But at the end of the day, until it's obeyed, some things are never going to reveal themselves. Doctrine is lifeless until it's practiced. Jesus, have mercy. I got into all kinds of stuff tonight I wasn't planning on getting into. Bible doctrines have no effect on our life whatsoever unless they're obeyed. That's just the bottom line. Jesus warned us in Matthew 23 and 3 to beware, stand with me, of the doctrine of the Pharisees. Anybody want to finish what he says there? Don't even put it up yet. Brother Josh, he says, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. Thank you, Brother Carlos. Why? Because they say and do not. They say but they don't do what they say. Preaching without practice becomes lifeless form. We say all the right things, but until we obey, Paul could say in 2 Timothy 3 and 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life. Powerful statement. You know what I believe by watching my life. Because his lifestyle was consistent with that doctrine he preached. And so I would propose to you in closing, the greatest danger in handling doctrine is that it may become truth apart from experience. We've got to live. Because truth that is not lived is powerless truth. Truth unlived is the greatest waste in the world. Truth with a powerful experience, though, in Jesus Christ will absolutely produce revival that door that's been open, nothing can stop truth and powerful experience. I remember reading in the 90s uh, of the great revival in Ethiopia where millions of people, 1.2 million, I believe, re received the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues in Ethiopia in a, in a great period of revival. And someone asked Sister Bobby Wendell, the first missionary to Ethiopia, what their national ministers would say if asked what brought that great revival into their country. And the answer offered was simply doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. They started preaching and living doctrine. And revival swept across the nation. It matters what you believe. Would you just put your hands in the heavens for just a moment, lift them toward heaven, and ask the Lord to impress upon you the truths of the word of God. Would you make some commitment? God, as I study your word and I see its truth, I'm going to obey it. I'm going to stop arguing. I'm going to stop debating. I'm going to obey it because I want it to be applicable and active in my life. God, I want it to enhance the experience of the Holy Ghost that is in me. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let your doctrine fall upon my life like yeast. Let it affect everything that I see, do, and, and am, God. Lord, I pray that it fall on me like rain. Let it be a reviving. Let it be a spirit of restoration and strengthening in the name of Jesus. God, I pray, let your doctrine fall upon me as the wind, carrying me into the things of God, and removing me from the things not of God. God, let your doctrine influence my character and my behavior and my destiny. Destiny, oh Lord. And God, I'm going to follow it. I'm going to be pure in my doctrine and pure in my life. Help me, God, to love people because of the right doctrine. God, help me to stand obedient before you because of the right doctrine. And Lord, let our commitment to this serve as that 20% difference that will impact our communities. Somebody say, in the name of Jesus, I pray it. I love you, and I pray that it's been a blessing to you tonight. I hope it's increased your faith.
I hope it's increased your understanding, and I hope that it has served as a complement to last Wednesday's session about the challenge of biblical discipline, the disciples' disposition. Get into his word, consume it, digest it, and fall in love with it. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Friday night, we'll see you at 730. Let's come ready to hear and receive from God.